So welcome everybody to this afternoon plenary session. Let's wait until you take your seats. It is a great pleasure to announce the third plenary of this workshop. It is uh, Stefano Stramigioli from Twente. You see a highly decorated person <laughs> who will tell about birds, fluids and interaction. And he wants to understand uh, nature, the physical system, theory, geometry and Port Hamiltonian systems. And I think we can be very curious for the next <laughs> hour. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. I will try to, to keep you awake after a heavy lunch like I had myself with the excellent Indian food. Uh, thanks a lot for organizing, uh, committed to, to invite me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here to talk to, to you, ladies and gentlemen. So I, I want to start with a citation. Um, at a second, strange. Of course, then it, nothing works anymore. What is, one second. Yes. So in all things of nature, there is something of the marvelous uh, Aristotle. And it was not the first, uh, the last who actually uh, wanted to understand better natures. And as an Italian, I could not leave a Leonardo da Vinci out of it. That 500 years ago already started to try to, to see and was puzzled by the beauty of nature. So this is actually the, the whole idea about what we're trying to do. And I, I will first introduce the idea of, of the projects, that is the Port Wings project, which is the RC Advanced Grant uh, Finance Project. And um, I will briefly revise port-based thinking, because I think most of you actually are aware about the, this, uh, the seminal work of Bernard and Arian on these topics, but I will just briefly go through it. And then I will introduce the challenges of the project as, as I defined it when I wrote it, and uh, after a quick review of exterior calculus, I will show you the, the first main results. And there are some very cool things coming up next. So um, first an introduction. So we have a, a bird in, in the Netherlands, which is pretty unique. It's a patented technology. It's the only bird that can fly at, uh, up to 80 kilometers an hour, uh, has the same flight frequency of a real peregrine falcon, the same speed, the same weight, I mean, there are a number of other birds, but they cannot fly outdoor with five and four winds. So it's a pretty unique thing. And uh, we're very happy that it was recognized in different ways with Tech Transfer Award, uh, Best Paper Award, et cetera, et cetera. But still, even if we, 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 we know, kind of understand more or less what is the basis why it, it works, these are some CFD uh, simulation. You see that there is a what is called the reverse von Karman sheet generation that basically creates these jets. So a central jet is because the, the vortices kind of across each other. Still is not very clear in 3D what's going on. And by the way, it's something which is also known and understood in biology is that there is this uh, unitless number, uh, which actually uh, it turns out that all fishes and all uh, birds you know that basically propel by by using uh, hydro or uh, aerodynamics actually uh, uh, working in, in the, a certain regime of this world number. So this was uh, the idea of starting to understand this using the only good methods that there is, which is port Hamiltonian systems, I think. And I was very happy that I, I got this, this big grant, which uh, has changed my scientific life in something extremely uh, challenging and, and uh, pleasant. Uh, if you're interested to know more about the philosophy of the, of the projects, what we, direction we want to go, this just a recent publication which gives an overview of the challenges we want to tackle. And I am extremely fortunate to have a, really a dream team. And uh, Federico and Rami are, are here. And um, where is, oh, there is. <laughs> and Andrea are here. And, and there are all the other guys are people who also work on more practical things. So what actually we are working on, is there are some fundamentals. And uh, then also the numerics, which actually Andrea is, is, is working on. Then we, uh, we have, uh, we're working on smart designs, on some smart materials, and um, uh, some experimental fluid dynamics uh, stuff. But what I will talk about today is actually more related to the first. And I will uh, briefly talk, touch about the second. And the work we've, uh, is actually based on a number of publications that came, uh, just came out, well, recently. The first one, uh, the first two is actually a journal Geometry and Physics. Uh, it, part one and part two are very long papers. 
And then we were invited to write a paper which was immediately accepted on the Physics of Fluid Journal, uh, which actually is the complete Navistokes open port, uh, 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 modular open port, as, as I will present today. And once again, this is a general overview. So what, what do we want to do? Well, we have this bird, and this bird is composed of, you know, there are some rigid things, like, for example, the body. You could see that the body is, is, is a rigid body. And uh, that's easy, I mean, reasonably easy, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of math in multi-body uh, analysis. By using Lie groups, you can properly model that. But the, the things get complicated when you look about the wings, because the wings, of course, are flexible, but even more complicated, they move in the fluid. So there's actually a PDE describing the, the, the motion of the wing, and there is a PDE describing the fluid. Not only the PDEs are complicated, but the boundary between the two, which are couples via power port, they move. So it's, 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 uh, it's not trivial. And it turns out that uh, actually you need some different kind of geometry and you need to, to use methods that we're trying to use, which are called vector value of tensor value differential forms, which can, will come uh, clear uh, later. So what are the conceptual challenges that we want to tackle in this? Well, the first one, I mean, to decompose the problem, that's why I put the, the picture, you know, who was the guy in the background, right? Bernard certainly knows. Yeah, of course, Descartes. So he was the one who said, you know, when you have a complicated problem, you have to decompose and make basically understand the various parts before you can even think about the complicated connection of the parts. So the first one is to understand the geometrically possibly curved coordinate free way to understand of open ideal fluids. Okay, so this is very important. This curve could be curved, any dimension, coordinate free and open. Then the next step is, okay, that was actually is the first purpose. The second one is really to understand how you, to handle advection, because I will show you later advection is the fundamental thing in order to decompose the uh, uh, in parts Navier-Stokes equations. And that the part two uh, in this paper, and then to really understand the full open Navier-Stokes, including bulk and, and, and shear uh, viscosity, which is actually the one on in the third paper I mentioned. Then, and this was major challenge to understand how to handle any moving boundaries, as I explained, which we need to do in the wings. I will not talk about this, but we are finalizing a paper which nailed it completely. Uh, and. To make numerical, to have numerical methods in order to, to simulate the all complicated stuff. And we are very close to something really, really hot that we are very uh, excited about. Okay, so what is our, let me tell you some, if you think so, our port based thinking. So this, once again, is the, the seminal work of Bernard and Arian. But I think the, the crucial thing is, you know, as Einstein said, you know, all theory of physics will be over, we may change, but there is one that will never change, and that's thermodynamics. Okay, so the concept of energy and power is, is, is the glue of physics for all possible domain. And that is why it's the, the basis of, of poor Hamiltonian systems. And, um, and physical model is really wants to exploit this to use the topology, you know, network theory in electrical circuits, you want to use the physical topology of the network. Instead in bond graphs and poor Hamiltonian system, the topology of energy distribution is what actually counts. Furthermore, Another important thing is what the difference between Hamiltonian system, the Hamiltonian theory and port Hamiltonian theory. Well, you know, there's a big difference. First, the, you know, if you want to go to, go to reduction, there's something which is called a Lee Poisson structure, which plays a major role in Hamiltonian theory, mechanics. And instead, in a port Hamiltonian system theory, which I call it the physics Lego, uh, is, is really the, the standard structure of Stokes Dirac structure. Hamiltonian theory is top down. Instead, port Hamiltonian system theory is bottom up. You want to decompose, as I said, you know, Descartes says to understand the complete problem, to understand first the various parts and components of it. Hamiltonian theory is closed. Instead, of port Hamiltonian system theory is completely open. And as I said, you know, the boundary, you can consider boundary which, which, uh, in which there is a flow of energy because we want to interconnect it to other parts. And last but not least, there is a natural way to talk about dissipation in port Hamiltonian system theory by describing, as you will see in the Navier-Stokes equation. 
the important things is the, the basically the embodiment of uh, uh, the, the power, what is called the power bond is the embodiment of the duality, tensor duality that you have in physics. That, you know, in a scalar case, it's very simple. You know, you have a current and voltage, is velocity and force, all the products of scalars. But when you start going to mechanics, then you have actually Lie groups that plays a, a, major, a major role. And what you have is that angular velocity and torques are dual, are intrinsically dual. You don't need any uh, inner product or things like that. You know, they are naturally dual. And it turns out that in continuous mechanics, as I will show you, you need the pairing that was introduced uh, uh, before is not enough. We need something more. And I will come that, that later. So in physical modeling, basically, the whole idea is to, to start from this equation. This is the important equation that basically tells you that energy is, is a conserved quantity, basically. And it is, well, uh, this is the port, but in any case, it's continuous. And the change in, in density, this H is, a, is a, what is called the top form. I will introduce it later. It's basically the change in energy can happen because there is a generation or a dissipation locally, or there can be a transfer in motion via a transfer through the space, which is the second term. And then, of course, then you, and the whole idea is that you can store this energy, so you can be elastically or inertially, that's the case of the fluids and the many other things in other domains. And you can dissipate it, but that's not correct, of course, because thermodynamics says the energy cannot be dissipated, but you can irreversibly transform it to heat. Okay, and then you, you have the concept of bulk and shear viscosity in Navier-Stokes. And then you have, and this is a very important major concept, is that basically the way that uh, in physics the role of, of position and velocity is play in, in mechanics is very special because position and velocities have a dual role. Have a role of uh, state, physical state, and have a role of kind of modulating how energy is transferred within the various parts. I will come to that later. This is the book that some of you may know, uh, which actually were the results of uh, my very first European project many, many years ago, uh, in which I had, a, it was a phenomenal project with Bernard, Arya, and, and, uh, and a number of other people, uh, which basically is kind of a reference now for if you want to know more about this topic. Very briefly, what about power ports? So, just think about uh, uh, two, well, uh, maps, uh, sections, if you wish, from the time to a vector space, and you have a, from a time to the dual of the vector space, and therefore then you can pair these two, and then you have a, a function that goes from time to power, okay? That's the basic idea of the embodiment of a port. So with this idea, for example, if you have an amplifier, this is a bond graph notation, so you have a voltage and you have the current, the pairing of these two is power, that's the power that goes from the amplifier to the motor. And then you may have that you have the torque and the angular velocity of the motor, which is attached to the joints, whose product, still two scalar, scalars, is the power that goes to the joint. And then you have, you need geometry because, you know, if you have 3D joints, then you have to, to you need to go to Lie groups, where SE3 would be basically the, 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 the angular velocity for, well, SE3 is the, the, the twist and S is three star is the range, so the total range six dimensional, so to speak, that goes in one direction, only in the other, okay? So this, this is the way you model and you decompose things, and this bond basically is a flow of energy from right to left, so uh, up and down. If you want to go to the infinite dimensional case, things are a bit more complicated, because you have a domain which is continuous. So what you need is you basically, this power pore becomes power port densities, and you want to integrate it on a manifold which represents the domain which divides the two domains you want to couple, so to speak. So if it is a surface, for example, you need to integrate the power flow on the surface that goes from inside to outside of the surface. And uh, we want that it works in all dimensions, should be coordinate free, applicable to all possible physical domains and possible in curved space. And that makes sense because if you look about meteorology, for example, Navi-Stokes meteorology, then, you know, the surface of the Earth is curved. And the answer to this is exterior calculus, as originally also introduced as a tool by Bernard and Arian. There is no other nice way. You know, when I see vector calculus, I just, my brain shuts down. If I, I, I can only understand if I see the geometry. That's the way my brain works. Okay, what are differential forms? Well, differential forms... It's, it's basically, uh, uh, it's a field. Field means, you know, it's like a function, but it's much more complicated than function. It's a continuous thing. 
then in every point x and for every time t is a is a multilinear totally anti-symmetric uh, map which takes k argument the k form takes k arguments which are vectors in that point and it returns a scalar okay so that's the definition basically a very sloppy definition of of, of a k form then what you can do with this stuff you can basically pair this form to a certain manifold and then you can give a results of the integral of that form on that manifold and in fact it turns out that a k form you can pay a k form to an m a k dimensional manifold and that returns the value of the scalar that can be a volume could be energy could be anything else which makes sense so one form measure are basically integrate on lines, two forms integrate on surface, three forms integrate on volumes. You go to whatever forms you want. And then you have a number of operators. And the most important operator is first the wedge product. Basically, if you have a, a K and an L form, these things returns in K plus L form. Okay, that would be important. And then you have a purely topological operator, no metrical operator, topological, it means only tells you how things are close to each other, not how big or small they are, so to speak, which is the operator D, which basically increases the form of one index, okay? So if you have a D of K form, you get a K plus one form. And this is generalized the concept of Stokes theorem to any kind of dimension, in which very open on books, you don't see the I star, which is extremely important, and is very often just left out, we will see that is absolutely fundamental. That's called the trace, okay? Which is basically is defined as the pullback of the inclusion map. So if you have a boundary, and the boundary, if you take a manifold with the boundary, the boundaries, you can have a map that goes from the boundary to the manifold itself, okay? That map, you can pull back to the boundary all the objects which are covariant that you define on the manifold itself. And then the last thing, which is instead a metric operator, it's called the Hodge. And the Hodge is another thing that basically maps K form to N minus K form, where N is the dimension of the space you are actually working with. These are all the things we actually will need. And then we can talk about power flow. As I said, you integrate the density. So what you basically have, these are power densities. And then you, the whole idea that you want to write this power density using the wedge, I told you, as the wedge of two things, so some of the indices will give you the dimension of the manifold you integrate with, because that will be the power that transfer. And these two forms are efforts and flows are called. Okay, so what it turns out that all everything I told you is just standard way that has been used so far. But it turns out that this is not all we need. We need something more. What we need are actually tensor value differential forms. So the story is the same as I say, as I tell you, but then instead of only considering that the integral is a scalar, that should be a tensor, okay? Well, not the integral. That's the wrong thing I said. The value of the form in a certain point is a tensor because stress actually needs that, as you will see later. So I will then start talking about port Hamiltonian coordinate free, open, the Fourier side, I will leave it out because actually we, we have also in the paper some things about Fourier, so how to handle heat and uh, entropy generation in n dimensions. So what this I will present is general to any dimension, coordinate free in every kind of situations. And it's open, that's an important thing. So you may first start and say, you know, you have a manifold, which is basically has no boundary. Let's think about the surface of the earth. Okay, it has no boundary because you have in the surface you look some people, the, uh, what's uh, the flat earth, uh, people think that there is a boundary, but there is no boundary actually. Um, then another situation which is used is that uh, um, the, um, the, the velocity of the fluid can only be constrained to be tangent to the boundary. Okay, so in that case, you also have no power flow uh, uh, out of the boundary. But of course, the most interesting situation is when the vector fields can get out of the boundary, okay? And this is exactly the, 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 what, we will, uh, what we will analyze. And the way we will do it is really to decompose Navier-Stokes in the following way. Well, actually, we'll start first with the Euler equation, in which we'll first look at the role of kinetic energy. And once we have the role of kinetic energy, because I told you that there's a dual role, which modulates everything else, 
Well, then I'll show you that all the rest, like, you know, uh, entropy and uh, uh, compressibility and uh, potential energy is all actually advected by this flow that modulates how things move around. You can very elegantly include this. So, first, some notation. So, you can model a vector field. Which this is a Eulerian vector, vector field. Sorry, Eulerian vector field, which means that in each point, if the, the vector field indicates the velocity of the particle which is there at that moment of time. So, the particle can move around, but it's always in the same point. And of course, it's a vector field. So, it has, uh, uh, you can consider it actually as a right invariant vector field, which has a Lie bracket. So, you can take Lie brackets of vector fields. And therefore, this uh, vector field here is, is what is called the Lie algebra. So it has, uh, is a vector space and has this skew symmetric uh, uh, pairing, which is the Lie brackets of vector fields. But it's very useful to use other representation. If you have a metric space, what is called a Riemann manifold, basically you have a way to map in a, by the metric to go from a vector to a covector. Okay? And this is what we will use here with nu. And which is sometimes used as a, as, a, as a flat of the velocity. This is a notation. So this is actually a one form. It turns out to be a one form. Another way, which is actually the one I will use to show you this, you can also go to an n minus one form for general n. In this case of 3D, that would be two form. Okay, but it's n form, which is basically saying, oh, excuse me. Oh, which basically what it does, it takes the volume form, which is an N form, and it contracts one index. So basically, it contracts it with the velocity of the field, and it turns out that that returns an N minus one form. And this is just another representation of the vector field, but if I want the, this operation in this representation, you could show, it is a bit complicated calculations, that if I then and have two n minus one forms, the brackets that I had there actually appears to have this form here, where this is the lead derivative, and the omega hat is the other, the other way around. So the omega is a n minus one form. If I take the hat of it, is the vector I started off with. Okay? And this is again a, a, an n minus one form, you see, because the, the lead derivative on an n minus one form is still an n minus one form. This is an n minus one for the beta, and the divergence of this thing is actually a scalar, which can be defined in a proper way. It's not important, not relevant, but this is the way it is defined. And then you have a relation via the arch of the representation as a n minus one form and as a one form. You remember the arch goes from n to sorry to k to n minus k. So in this case, k is one. Okay, so what you then can do, and this is just to give you an intuition what's going on, is you could show that if you take the, so the Lie brackets, you could also write it as an operator in this way, and this operator as an adjoint operator, and a formal adjoint operator, which you could show to have this form. But the important thing is that if you really calculate, this is basically the adjoint relation between one operator and the other, but you could naturally show just by using the, the, the calculation in differential geometry, these terms appear. And that term is, of course, a boundary term, okay, that appears. And what is, you can see about this term is that you see is the pairing of x and beta, where x is one side and beta is the other, so it's a, a scale as Ardua variables, that actually with the odds, X, X vector beta is an n form, the odds makes it a zero form, so it's a power on the boundary. And actually, this is a, a component which is zero for tangent vector fields. So, in case you are back in the situation in which, because it's a form, so it's a bit counterintuitive, but basically, when that is zero, because the, the, the vector field on the boundary are tangent, there is no flow of power out. So everything is, and the boundary disappears, which is the case without boundary. Then what you could see from, from analytical mechanics, there is something which is called reduction. And then if you, you could show that in a fluid uh, context, basically you, you have an equation like this, which is called the Lipposon reduction, where X would be the state that, that we'll use in this dynamics, okay? And if I have this equation, I could pair it with a dual, so a kind of weak formulation, if you wish. 
And, and I, I would get the equation which is here. And then if I, which I, in which I substituted here, the omega is substituted here, the, uh, the um, uh, variational derivative. So then if you substitute it also in beta, what you get is a power balance which tells you that indeed the change in internal energy, which is what you can think about this, you know, the, 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 the variation of, of H with respect to the state and then the change of the, uh, as a function of time of the state is equal to the power that is inserted in the domain plus the power flux that goes outside the domain. So this is, is the way that, that this can be in details calculated and eventually you will get a form like this the old results of the calculation, which tells you basically that in uh, uh, um, using a momentum representation in this case, you basically have a Dirac structure, you have a storage of kinetic energy, only kinetic energy, this is important at this stage, and then you have a boundary port and a distributor port, so the port in which is within the domain, which will be very important to connect it to the rest, and the boundary of the domain. And you could see that, uh, you know, calculate the various things. It's not important at this stage. The next step is to say, okay, everything else is actually advected by this. I told you the role of kinetic energy. Energy moves things around. So what you can do is basically that these red dots, it's another form, it's another field, which could be entropy, which could be mass, uh, and, and anything else you would like to model, which is basically moved around by the flow uh, of the particles. And it is conserved, it means because it's just moved around, right? It's not this, it doesn't disappear, it's just moved around. So what it means is that this equation is basically saying the lead derivative in space-time, in other words, you know, if something decreases, it means it's moved and it cannot be generated or dissipated there. So it's conserved quantity. So this is a definition of what is called an advected quantity. Then uh, you can think, okay, what is the V? Well, the V is the vector fields of the fluid, which basically move things around, okay? So the fluid acts, moves this advected quantity alpha via kind of group action. And you can formalize this by saying that you have a group, that's a group action that moves the advected quantity from one value to the next one, which is the same, is the same set, actually, is a, is a, it turns out to be an automorphism. So it basically is a map of vector quantity to the same set. But what it actually represents is that if you have the free motion from a certain situation to the next one, all the advected quantity, which could be, for example, also the labels of the particles, have been just moved, okay? Once we have this, we can go to the uh, um, kind of differential representation in which you could see that the velocity, so the G is a group, and the group has an algebra, so it's basically an infinitesimal generator of the group action. And then if you fix the first parameter, so this is what you fix, this parameter you fix, and you use the group infinitesimal generator, then of course you would get to something on the tangent space in a certain point alpha, which you have. That's nice because this is a map like this, you know, so it goes from the group, and remember, the group is actually what we use to represent the motion of the fluid to the motion of the vector quantity. Okay, so this is, you see that this map is, is representing how the motion of the fluid has an effect on the advected quantities. But that's great, because if we have one direction, we know that bond graphers and people, they always want to know what the direction opposite is, is the dual. And this is exactly what you need, because if you look at this, what you can recognize is that this one is basically the motion of the fluid, okay, and the carrier, the kinetic, uh, kinetic power, if you pair these two variables. And then you have, that is the omega introduced before, and this is the variation, the change in uh, advected quantity. But if that is a variation as a function of time, then you can integrate it. And if you have an energy function, function of that, Okay, you can take the variational derivative, and what you have is dual to that variables, which you feed it back. And this is the whole idea, because this is the induced dynamics of adapted quantities, field-wise. And this is very general. Any dimension, coordinate, variant, etc. What can you... Yes? On top of... Uh, 
No, no, no. It's it's this is the this is the alpha, okay. And then you take this is the dual element, and the dual element returns back. So this is the energy variable. So this is the the uh, the flow. This is the energy variable, and this is the effort. Yeah. So you can recognize this as for, for people with background in bone graphs as a, as a modulated transformer, which is modulated by what the value of the vector quantities at a certain instant of time. And this is nothing else than the C element. Okay. And, and actually you could show, and in the paper this is not shown, but you could show, that this is exactly what happens when you have a semi-direct group structure in which you have an action of a group on something else, which is advecting, is advect like, you know, a heavy top and all these kind of things. It's always the same. This is what's going on. And then you could basically pull back this storage to the other side and you would have a semi group structure. I will not talk about it. So this is actually, we are a bit further because now we have the kinetic energy and then we have a DR structure which we interconnected via the, the way I described. And then you have here, in this case, is, is for compressibility, it's the mass flow. Okay. But, this could be anything, could be any other things which is a vector. So it's very general. I'll show you uh, in, in a moment. And these are the boundary ports. Notice that in the boundary port, you have here the same flows, here and here. Okay. And then you can co basically connect these two bonds with what is called the one junction. So basically, you have the same flow and you sum the efforts of those bonds, which would be the, the total. Uh, um, uh, um, at the ratio of, of, the, of, the, of the row would be basically. Uh, the total pressure, which is around the, 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 in, the in this specific case of uh, of the boundary, and then you see also there are dependent states. Well, it's obvious because this semi-direct group structure couples the motion of the groups to the motion of the uh, 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 mass uh, top form, which was actually also in the kinetic energy, but it's something which is advected because the mass is advected with the fluid. And you could show clearly that the total energy is the sum of these two energies. And you see, this is the way we built, I show you the beginning. So we have this kinetic energy. And then from this kinetic energy, then you have, we just did in this case, one of these, uh, of, uh, these lines, but you could ad attach all the things which are adve advected and could be entropy beside and at the same time, because you could even sum all of them because the, 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 the group will actually move various quantities around. So it's very general. So this is the end of the story for the Euler equation. So as long as conservative situation is, is at stake, everything is, is kind of sorted out. The big question is, of course, how do you handle in a general context dissipation? So, and of course, we want to do it in a port open way. So what we're looking for is something you can attach here, which we don't know what it is, in which you basically will have a kind of R element which dissipates. So basically, I should better say, transform irreversibly the, the power to heat. And you will see that, of course, very likely there will be also a boundary term appear. So we need some new things then, because then otherwise things will not work out. First thing we can notice is if we indicate H, and H here is the, the energy density, so it's an, it's an N form, okay? So if you integrate that on a volume, you know the energy which is contained in that volume. You could show that if you pair this energy, well, you take the inner product with, uh, with the velocity field, eh? you, you know, an N form has N argument, right? So if I collapse one of the arguments with the velocity of the flow, I still have N minus one argument open. So it's an N minus one form, right? Then if I take then the trace of that, we need, you need to take the trace because you want to evaluate it on the boundary, that would give you the power that basically goes out of, of the boundary, right? Well, it turns out with some identities, you could show that uh, this is equal to this when the odds I introduce. You see, I take the V, I take the B. So from the velocity V, I take the, the one form, which is V uh, flat, okay, which is a one form. And I take the wedge of the, sorry, I take the odds of that, which is an N minus one form. I mean, everything works out dimensionally wise. And then, and this is crucial, you can 
um, distribute the trace through the wedge product. So this is what comes out. And if you do that, that's, that's nice because then you say, okay, then I know exactly how to, in a general sense, to talk about flux of energy through the boundary, which is nothing else that the effort is, you can define as the, the odds of, of the energy and form tra trace wedge and the effort and the flow is basically, as we said before, is the, the direction of flow of the energy. That's great. Unfortunately, in mechanics, there's something which is called a stress. And the stress is a strange beast, because the stress is handled in many different ways, in very many different things, ways I don't like personally, but what is physically stress? Stress is something that you have on a surface, and is a force like, you know, you integrate it on a surface, and if you integrate these things on a surface, it returns a force, okay? So it is actually, something you integrate on the surface, so it should be a two forms in a 3D domain, right? In general, an N minus one form. And then it should have it as an argument, it's not a scalar, but it's a vector, it's the force, which you integrate. Be careful, you cannot do that in curved spaces, okay? So because you cannot sum, integration is sum, you cannot sum a vector here and a vector there. So this is something which, you know, it's done because you are in a Euclidean space, but in a curved space you cannot do that, warning. What is nice that you can always do it with if you first pair it. And this is another thing that tells me that the bone graphs and the portal between the system is the way to go because it's very general. Because if you have the, if you pair it like this, the force part is, is paired locally with the velocity in that point. That's the power in that point, right? And then you integrate a scalar valued form. So no problem. The question is, can I do the same game I did with the energy? The answer is that, well, why would I be able to do? Well, if you have a top form, an end form like the energy, you can always interpret that end form like a, a one form value n minus one form. Right? You could show that it's always possible, but the opposite is not the case. So if you see the stress, the stress is in a one form n minus one form, but I cannot write that as an end form because it's not totally skew symmetric as then n form should be. So this is not possible. And we need something else. And now I need to introduce some mathematics, which is very simple, but I, I just want to convey the intuition. First, let me introduce the concept of nested manifolds. Some people use it in what I call two-point tensors or things like that, but the idea is a very fancy name to say basically one thing. You have two manifolds, U and M, and you have a map which is injective that goes from U to M, okay? In our case, what we'll use is the sec second example here. So the orange one is the boundary of the manifold you want to talk to. The M is the manifold with boundary, of course, and the I is the inclusion map, okay? That's what I will need it for. Then I can talk about tensor valued forms on a nested manifold, what does it mean? Well, it means nothing else that I can consider the form side in the U, in the image here, but the value depending on the M. Why would I do that? Well, the situation is the following, is that if you have a boundary and you want to talk about stress and you are on the boundary, you need to be able to talk about vector which are not only normal to the surface but only also tangent to the surface. So the value is not only depending on the boundary, but it depends on how you want to interconnect the boundary with the rest. And that is why you need these things that you will see later. So this is nothing else than saying that I have, you know, the F here indicates and tells you that this is the value of the form, but the value of the form, because it's a tensor valued form, is actually defined on the, on the on the manifold, the bigger family, which is mapped by F. This is what this notation says. And then you need the something new, which is what is called the partial trace, which basically takes something which is defined both on M, you see? You start from M, but then you take the trace only of the second leg, if you wish, okay? So you take the trace so that you can go to the situation we are talking about, an inclusion map. 
And then I can introduce finally what we'll need in order to talk about continuous mechanics, which is what we call the dot wedge product, which is basically allows me now to pair things which have a value as a tensor. So, for example, the stress tau has a value as a form, so it's a force, a force like, okay? And I can pair this force with the velocity, okay? I can pair force with the velocity, that gives me a scalar. And then I take the wedge of the two forms. You see now I have a P form here and a Q form here. And what you result is now a scalar value P plus Q form. So it's basically you have two tensor valued form whose values are dual. You pair them in each point and then you integrate it by taking the wedge of the two forms to defense. Okay, this is the concept of the, of the wedge dot pairing, which is basically the only extension that it is, is that it has a value in the, as, as a tensor, which is paired if it's dual first. That's all it is, but it's fundamental. And then it is possible to show that now where T being the, not an N form, but you know, like the stress, I can then distribute the trace through the wedge dot, but it becomes a partial trace. So this was the case we had before, but now we have this case in which I can show that if I have a stress and a velocity, okay, then you can basically do the trace and you distribute it, you have a partial trace, and that will be the values of the efforts and the flow. In 3D, for example, what we have, we will have that the stress is a one value two form, it's a diff complicated way of saying, which is a, basically in each point you have a force-like vector and then you, uh, you can integrate it on a surface. And then you have the velocity, which is nothing else that uh, this is a, a zero form, so it's a function if you wish. So it's just a vector field, which is nothing else that the, the vector field, the partial trace would be the vector field evaluated only on the surface of the boundary. But the vector field can be normal to the surface, tangential to the surface in every direction. That's the important thing. Okay, so then we can finally get to how to, to handle Navistokes. Without going into too many details, this is why, how you would write Navistokes in a, in a tensor notation, but in Euclidean setting, no coordinate invariance. So what you may recognize here is this is momentum balance. Okay, this is a material derivative. This is the static pressure, which is split from the stress, which is generated by the dissip dissipating stress, the viscous stress. So the P is not there, but is a separate in this case. You have a mass continuity. And this is the way stress looks like. So you have a bulk stress. So what bulk stress is basically the dissipation that the particle have when they, they have a divergence, that they, they get out or they get close, they move with respect to each other, and there's stress in that case. And the second one is a shear. The shear also if particle have a shearing motion, but not only, there is also a, 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 a symmetric component, uh, sorry, uh, um, within the shear, there is also a kind of divergent part, which you could write things different, but it's all there. And in this case, I will only handle the barotropic situation. So if you want to do things right, the way you, you step toward will be the following. Well, first, I have the velocity V, G is the metric, so as I did before, I can define nu as the one form in this case, I just, the different representation. Then I can talk about the mass top form by having the density of the fluid. The density is a scalar. You take the odds, you get an N form, which is the mass form. The stress, as I introduce it, as a factor value N minus one form. The pairing, as I introduce it, the dot wedge dot pairing. And then you need a new thing, which is called the exterior covariant derivative, which basically mixes topological and metric property of the thing which satisfy this kind of Leibniz rule, which basically says, okay, I have this operation, and you get a topological part, which only uses the D, and you have a, geometric, a geometrical part, we only use the co covariant differential, which is something in differential geometry, which is, uh, uh, it's not a covariant derivative, it's covariant differential. So if you take the covariant derivative, you usually put something under, which repairs it, gives you the value of that, but if you don't put that thing, it basically increases the tensor of one covariant uh, index. 
And <clears throat> you need this because look at this here. The stress is something which is defined on the surface. But if you want to write it in a balance like a momentum equation, you want to define it in a volume, right? So you need to take the divergence, okay? So this is actually what you need is the divergence you need in this kind of complete geometrical context. And then, and this is the crucial insight, this is the reason why we need this uh, tensor value form. If you take the metric and you have a rigid motion, if you have a rigid motion, the metric doesn't change. But if the metric uh, uh, fails to be rigid, that lead derivative will be different than zero. And that will measure, measure basically the shear and the, the rate of strain that you have in this motion. And notice that everything I'm using are all forms, are all skew symmetric, but if you take the lead derivative of something which is symmetric, it's still something which is symmetric. And in fact, you need to use it in a very particular way, which is the crucial core of the whole idea, as we will see later. By doing that, you get to this equation, which are a completely covariant formulation of Navier-Stokes equations, which these are the called the on-shell equations. So really, the, the fluid will satisfy these equations. But they are not yet, and, and notice this is important. You see these terms here, which I told you was symmetric. What I do here, you have two indices, uh, sorry, it's symmetrics. Of the second index, I take the odge, so it becomes a two form. So these things, by this operation, from a, two, from a symmetric matrix, so to speak, with two indices, then it becomes a one form value, two forms which resembles things related to stress and stuff, which is this thing here. And this is, in fact, exactly the stress. The, the shear stress, if you multiply by the, by the constant, which tells you how, what the shear is. And the other one is only a divergence. You see, the, the bulk is only a divergence. OK, so if we go back to the off-shell, so if you just take the energy balance that you would have, the kinetic energy and the potential energy in these situations, this would be the, the energy balance, but this only tells you the, 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 what are called the, the off-shells equations and that you can calculate. But in this case, now we know what we can put in this equation as this variable to get the on-shell equation of the dynamics. And by doing that, a lot of calculations, you could show that basically what you get is this. You see that the orange part, by introducing a lot of terms, appears. And notice that all these terms, the beauty of all these terms, are all paired. In, so you have a pair. This is a normal wedge. This is a normal wedge. What you see here, there is a wedge dot. OK? And you remember the, the issue I told you about the trace. You cannot put it through, so you need a partial trace here. That's why I introduce it. Well, this is not a wedge, but you can write it like this. So this is, indeed again, an effort flow pair, a port. And this is a nasty thing because it's the, the, the shear, which will again need a wedge dot product in order to be a properly represented. So what you can see, and this is very cool, is that all the, the terms you see here, which are the, the state, the thunder, the, the terms you, you had where you did not have dissipation, so the Euler situation, if you wish. And this one are the one with the dissipation, okay? These are all the boundary terms these things appear, and this is something which is nothing else. So the nature of energy and the nature of stress is exactly the same. So you can put these two things and interpret both, not as n form, because you can't, I told you, but you can interpret both as one form value, n minus one form, and then you can sum them. And what this is, is the energy stress tensor. Okay, it basically tells you everything that can go out of the surface which represents the flux of energy due to stress and due to energy. And this is pretty neat. And also what you can see, well, these boundaries usually are static in the situation you see mostly, but this is true for everything. The cool thing, think about a sphere in a fluid, okay? If the sphere in the fluid, you have a sphere in the fluid, and the sphere you knows not moving, you could write Navier-Stokes equation. But now, you know that there is a zero slip condition, right? So they, 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 on the, on the, they have the same velocity. But now suppose that you have the mass and the mass starts rotating, okay? What will happen? Well, if there is a Euler equation, nothing. The fluid will not move. 
But if these things rotate, of course, due to the zero slip condition, the fluid will start to rotate and you create a motion in the fluid. And this is very elegantly can, can express all this. Well, actually, when we, in, in something of varying boundary, which we, we, we have not finished, but this is what, in, and to, in order to do that, that's the point, you need the velocity on the boundary, which is tangential. You could not do with the, only the normal component. Otherwise, you would not be able to express this, this, these things. And that, of course, needs a partial trace as I introduced it. You could show, I will not do it, you could show that actually you can very, very nicely characterize the damping, she the shear stress as a transformer and a, a positive definite operator for the shear and, excuse me, for the bulk and for the shear, when you would see <coughs> naturally the boundary also appearing. And actually, this is a situation for a new Newtonian fluid, but thanks to the to the, the beauty of power to Hamiltonian system, this way of thinking, you could generalize now this by proper nonlinear situations, which would give you even the same structure for non-Newtonian fluids. This is absolutely mind-blowing, in my opinion. And then you would have this bone graph, which is Navier-Stokes, the dear Navier-Stokes structure, in which you have the energy. Okay, total energy, now you have the kinetic energy and advected energy quantities and stuff. You have the R, which is the part where the energy goes via to shear and, and bulk. And actually in the paper, we haven't worked it out, but there are some ints and actually something we want to work out because we can also make this, what is called an RS element that generates the entropy and it transports the entropy as an advected quantity and which could close the loop. We haven't done it yet, but we can do that. And then, of course, you have this boundary that now are written separately. But of course, if you want the Lagos block that you want to connect of Navier-Stokes, you want one port which expresses the boundary. Well, you can only do that if you express everything like this wedge dot, for the reason I told you. Everything which is expressed with the wedge, you can suppress it with wedge dot, no problem, but not the other way around. So it's something you really need is a new pairing that is absolutely essential to be able to tackle this stuff. So in the paper also that I will not, I have not talked about and I'm getting to the conclusion is an in interpretation of Laplacian, which was, is something which, you know, you have different Laplacian, you have the Hodge Laplacian, you have Ricci Laplacian, you know, how, how they are related and also to, to the advection and diffusion <coughs> uh, equation of vorticity. And as I said, there are some very cool stuff on, uh, uh, Federico has been working on, on, on the, on the, 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 distribute, the diffusion, basically, of the heat and the generation. Because if you have, of course, viscosity, then you have a, a entropy generation, which is then affected with the fluid, and you can go around. So what are the next steps? The next step, which is actually finished, it's pretty cool. I'm very excited. It's, I haven't presented. We are finalizing the paper. It renewed the situation of varying boundary. We are able now to take a rigid body to put it in a fluid, to move it, and you can simulate, because of course the boundary is changing, you know, the fluid is as a boundary which is changing, or the body which is indicated out there, and then the dynamics of the rigid body, and, and we nailed it. So you, you will see how this can be handled, we'll finish up with the paper now. The next thing, we're looking how to simulate all this stuff in a, gener in a gener geometric way, and we want a novel symplectic mimetic discretization methods, and, and we are very close <coughs> with Andrea and Rami to, to a really a, a breakthrough on, on, on the topic. So let me show you a video about the bird and closing the presentation. I don't hear any audio. Working in aviation, oh. waste management, or agriculture, one knows that birds can be of great nuisance. Birds spread diseases pick up waste and pollute the surroundings. Nothing, however, tops the risk of bird strikes in aviation. Clear Flight Solutions has the answer to your problems. The Rowbird. The Rowbird is an environmentally friendly solution for all your bird-related problems. It is a flapping wing robotic bird that not only looks like a bird of prey, but also flies like one. We have many years. It is completely autonomous, but it's for law you cannot drive it autonomously. Our certified pilots are experts in flying our rovers. As safety is paramount, 
our rowbirds are equipped with state-of-the-art autopilots, GPS, and geofence systems. We make sure that the pilot in command is always in control. The instinctual behavior of birds when confronted with a predator is flocking together for maximum safety. By flying around the flock, the pilot can remove the birds lastingly in the direction of choice. Shortly after this, birds will start to recognize the area as a territory of prey and will start avoiding it. By mimicking nature, Clear Flight Solutions creates a unique bird control system that birds will never get used to. We make sure your skies stay clear. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for the enthusiastic and very interesting talk. And now we are open for questions. Who would start? Thank you for the great presentation. So I was wondering how do you handle disturbances, for example, strong winds in these kind of applications? Uh, what do you handle what? Uh, disturbances. I mean, from a controlling point of view? Yeah. Until now, we're doing modeling, eh? Okay. So this situation, I mean, the, the bird that you see now is the way it works is it has a symmetric flapping. And one of the goal of, of the project is actually to understand how fluid dynamics works because then we can steer by doing asymmetric flapping. And the steering of the bird has two, you have seen, you have a, a two flapper uh, behind, you can do it in common mode, you have a pitch and you have the roll by indifferential mode. And the way it works, you, you get a thrust by, uh, and that's, you know, why that you get a thrust is something we want to understand. But it turns out that, that the formation of the wing is fundamental. So there is a 3D effect. Uh, and then once it has lift, then you just steer it. So it's done now. And in an autonomous mode, which we did, it's not a big deal. It's very stable. You know, it's very stable when it, when it moves. So there, that is not a problem. But from a controlling point of view, once we understood everything, we will, we will close the loop and do control, yeah. Another question, please. Bernard. So, thank you for a nice talk, Stefano. Something I probably did uh, um, see in your slides, explicitly written, is that you said that um, the Omega, so the, uh, the spatial domain is... Uh, Maybe time varying, yeah. The, the boundary, yes. But you didn't. I mean, I didn't. No, I, I didn't handle this. No, no, no. Okay. So I, that's I, for, I, I that's the paper we are finalizing. I haven't handled anything. So, um, but in, in two words, so maybe in abstract. Uh, yeah. So, words, it's, I mean, it's, what would be the point of view that you will promote in the next paper? Yeah. So the uh, the paper is, is you will see soon. It will will finalize this paper. Basically, once you have the boundary then it turns out that you represent the coupling by a, 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 the fact that moving the boundary energy moves from the two domains, right? So you'll have, I actually, it turns out to be kind of dual port C that appears that then will couple the two domains. And uh, the important thing is that to be general, you will need this wedge dot pairing because, for example, take the rigid body in the fluid, as I said before, right? If you have a sphere which is symmetric, okay, and you rotate... Point-wise, there's nothing happening in the domain, right? The boundary is a manifold is, is the same, so to speak, but it's not, right? Because from one object is rotating, right? So you need to be able to express that motion on the boundary, which can only be expressed is the velocity described on the boundary is not only a normal component, but also a tangential component. So that is why also in the varying boundary situation, the dot wedge is absolutely essential. You cannot do without it. <clears throat> so, so, so the question was more, I mean, like, what would be the pairs of dual port variables concerning the motion? It's like the stress. It would be something related to the, st to the stress. So you will have a, a one form value, N minus one form, and the dual, which indicates the motion of the boundary, basically. I ask it because, um, I'm, okay, I'm, 
I'm so thinking it, about interfaces. So yeah, so the boundary a model of the interface. Think about the boundaries moving, right? So you have a, each point of the boundary you want to move it. So you want to express the velocity of each of the points of the boundary, okay? And that velocity is a vector field defined on the boundary. But so it needs this, this things so of dual point tensor because it is the final of the boundary, but the motion of that point needs to be in the total space kind of, okay? So that is one port. And then you have the dual, which is the one which is basically has a, na a mathematical nature like the stress, because if you want to pair it, you want to get to a real which pairs with the force in that point and that gives you energy flow. Yeah? I have another question. So this uh, wedge dot operator, so did I understand correctly that this is now an object which you discovered because now you explicitly are treating the boundaries and because there's a lot of work on exterior yeah. calculus and people who know how to write down equations, but it hasn't been done yet because nobody t uh, had attention on the boundaries. Or I mean, it, it is uh, the equation you saw of David Stokes uh, written with the uh, covariant uh, with the D uh, uh, Nabla. Okay, I mean, there is a work which was cited on the slide, which was an inspiration for the things we've been doing. But to, to describe this as a pairing, because we need, we, we, it was not there because, you know, people don't usually think about ports. And in order to, to be able to, to uh, you know, we, we were struggling with the shear because things would not work out until we realized what the mathematical structure is that you need for the reason I, I hope I explain a little bit, that you need to consider the value on the boundary, not only as something which is defined on the boundary, but something which is, Define on an including space somehow because the boundary can move also in all the, in both directions. And then once that was realized for the Navistokes, when we started working on the varying boundary, we said, well, that's exactly what you need there as well because it's a kind of similar situation because of the, the, the example I gave you of the rigid body rotating, right? So it is absolutely essential if you talk about varying boundary, this is a, a pairing you, you need to have. Thank you. Is there another question? So, if this is not the case, then let's thank us again, Stefano. Pleasure.